Just like Gordon Lightfoot, another one of this country's great songwriters, Gord Downey can be a man of few words. But wow, can he say a lot, tons of meaning within the confines of a three minute song. It was in Bob Cajun, I saw the constellations reveal themselves one star. Hard to believe, but Gordon the Tragically Hip have been with us almost 30 years. The hip earned respect the hard way, working their way out of the clubs of Kingston to become one of the country's most treasured bands, and all the while giving perfect voice to Canadian stories. Stories about our game. They can win another to 1962. Our justice system. 20 years for nothing, well, that's nothing new. Or the people on our First Nations. Now Gord's digging even deeper than usual. While he was writing the Hips' new record, Now for Plan A, his wife Laura was diagnosed with breast cancer, an experience that made him want to completely rethink what he'd be doing as an artist. Please welcome to the program, Gord Downey. It's nice to see you, man. It's good to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's, it's good to be here. It's, um, Oops. Like, like, I mean, a, a hip record is a cause for celebration at any time because it's beautiful. We get to go down this road with you. And then, you know, recently seeing The National in your interview with Wendy Mesley, then there's this whole other thing that comes with it. When you got the word about your wife's diagnosis, what, tell me, what, what was that avalanche like? Um, well, I was going through my notebooks, uh, and I keep notebooks for things like um, groceries and um, pithy comments um, with which to, you know, regale you. <laughs> what to say to George, dot, dot, dot. And I remember going back to that day just the other day, perhaps in anticipation of this, and I found a list of things that I had to bring back. We uh, have this farm up by Kingston, in Prince Edward County on the lake. And uh, the list was just all these things I had to bring back to the city because we weren't going back there mm -hmm. um, anytime soon. And my wife had split immediately. And I was actually out on Maine Duck Island, 17 miles out in the middle of Lake Ontario, which everyone should visit sometime because the water, it gets very shallow out there. It's 12 feet deep and the swimming is incredible. It's like this oasis that no one knows about. It's the lake that raised you. Yeah. Anyway, I was out there, no communication. I got back, the house was empty. and. And um, so I had a list of things to bring home from pads to socks to the toothpaste on top of the thing by the thing over. And um, so that was the first avalanche. And um, you're kind of happy for those kinds of lists to keep yourself um, busy and occupied and, uh, and, um, and useful. When you write lyrics and you know that it's apparent in, your, in this particular record that you're saying things, kind of letting people know that your family have gone through something, maybe continue to go through something. Was there any, what was the decision process like to, to put that in there? Because you're an intensely private man, and this isn't an abstract thought you're putting out here. You're talking about nurses. You're talking about very direct things. What was that decision process like for you? Well, I couldn't really, um I couldn't really do anything about it. You know, I was writing, I wanted to, uh, there's a lot of emotions, you know, anger, fear, uh, impatience. Impatience is a big one. Um, love, you know, you're just uh, clamoring to, to help. So, um, you know, uh, when Laura was uh, free and clear, uh, we went, got back into it in the studio um, it's sort of hard to write during, because uh, that felt, you know, I don't know, somehow not right. I don't know. I was taking little notes, maybe. But um, once she was free and clear, we went into the studio to finish the record, which had been put on hold. Um, uh, everything had to achieve a standard, I thought, of uh, reality, you know, and illusion wasn't really cutting it, and to the extent that I have contributed to the illusion machine all these years, um, and to the extent that I tried to extricate myself from the illusion machine now was very basic 
you know, I wanted to write um, fairly clearly, openly. Um, but having said that, um, I still write the way I write. And it maybe is not entirely obvious, but I thought it would be obvious to the people to whom it would be obvious. For the long, I've sort of, my friends and I have lived their life between certain lyrics from, that you've written over the years. For the longest time it was, for a good life you just might have to weaken. Mm -hmm. And on this one, it's, there's got to be more than just despair, or just despair. Where did that one come from? I'm just um, one of the many things that a man tries to say uh, to his wife who's going through this, like so many of her friends are going through this, a woman that's made all the right decisions eaten all the right things, exercised right, um, and is trying to make sense of it. Um, and, uh, you, you know, uh, I'm trying to matter. I mean, because she would, you know, listen to and go to almost anybody but me. My jobs were very menial and very um, basic. You know, get my chickens out in the morning and get them in. And, um, but on the moral support side, I, I fell short a lot. You know, That's which maybe only a husband can. It's an interesting thing about the conversation around breast cancer is because you, you obviously hear a lot about it from the context of the woman, as you should, and the family. But are there a lot of systems in place for what a man should do, what a man can do, what a husband can do in this scenario, or a partner in any way? Well, I think a man should be just satisfied with the little joys that sacrifice can bring. But a man should also only consider those things long after the fact. Um, because in the middle of it, it's useless. And, um, you know, um, yeah, I mean, my wife's health and happiness is its own reward, obviously. Right. And, um, and, yeah, that's all I really care about. But I don't know that the support group for men of women with breast cancer, it might have to wait till we figure this one out. Yeah. You know, I'd rather be part of that support group trying to figure out why, um, you know. Does it, I mean, you've always been a staunch environmental supporters, community supporter. You take a look at communities all across this country that are going through unbelievable assault on an environmental level, which contributes to, to the, the poor health and lack of well-being for many people. Does that just sort of solidify your anger in that respect? I don't know if it's anger. But I don't know that you can go around and cut environmental assessments where a community is allowed to sort of assess the safety of a project. I don't think you can gut the Fisheries Act. I don't think that you can throw over science and research for ideology, you know, and not expect there to be casualties. There will be blood if you're going to do that. Toxins go to the fatty tissues, and everybody knows that. Yet it appears that that's where we're at in a lot of communities. What do we do about that? Well, just what we're doing, I guess. You know, my friend Alan Gregg was talking about it today in the Toronto Star, and social network is, you know, it's got to be good for something beyond, you know, and it's never been easier, quicker, easier to mobilize opinion and support for things. Um, but that wouldn't be, you know, that would be a, that wouldn't be a bad thing to try to see if that works right. in mitigating the amount of breast cancer, you know. We'll play a clip. This is where the, you know, where the hip goes and the things that they do. Take a look at this from not that long ago. So there's uh, Gord and the band. They're at the Great Moon Gathering. Was that Northern Revolution you're on stage with? Northern Revolution. Best part about that, I believe that the that video was filmed off the, from the phone from a mother of one of the people that was on stage with yeah. you. I mean, just that's what a trip that must have been for you to be up there. You were Joe Boyden, right? Yeah, and the band. And Joe asked us to go up because he was the keynote speaker. And would we come up and 
in that particular case, they asked me to sing Knockin' on Heaven's Door, and they were pretty particular that it was the Guns N' Roses version. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, no problem, you know? And I was like, no, it's, it's different. And, um, and then they told me that their singer, uh, whose name is eluding me right now, I got it wrong in the evening, too, and said it about seven times in the <laughs> mic. Um, but they wanted to, they told her to take a, a seat so that I could sing the song. Right. And I was like, you never throw over your singer. What are you doing? She's your singer. <laughs> she's coming up here with and us. She's like, no, it's okay. I, I can't hit the notes. And I was like, well, then you come with me. <laughs> and then I said, okay, okay, cool. And, and then it was like, um, and then I introduced her onto the stage by her wrong name. She didn't hear it, dude. I bet you she heard it right, no matter how it happened. What's her name? You must have people that can figure that out. <laughs> we can figure it out. Do you, uh, do you feel like an elder statesman in some respect? That was a, a kind of a fake. <laughs> uh, Spit take is the other option. So you, I like the one you chose. <laughs> Neither. <laughs> elder statesman. Um, hmm. Musically. No. No. I mean, I'm still trying to... I like challenge more than expectation, more than meeting expectation. That's kind of dull and tiring. So the idea of kind of going out and challenging yourself and either playing to people that have never seen you before or doing things in front of the people that have seen you before that they've never seen before. <laughs> that made sense. But, so I like that. How do you figure that out? Because you said before that you're, you're up there and it's, you're on this ride, but do you ever study some of the other people? Do you ever look, like, look for inspiration in unique places? Well, I was reading something today John Cage uh, was talking about, and um, I thought it sort of applied about how, well, he didn't put it this way, but I extrapolated that, you know, songs are only half finished when they're recorded, that you have to perform them to finish them. And I thought that was, I feel like that's what's going on every night, that you're still trying to finish this song, you know? He also, the stage is like this, is the underlying question at which you're just throwing solution after solution after solution. But again, I'm extrapolating from this book I'm reading about John Cage. Maybe the book is only half finished when yeah, the book is yeah. done. <laughs> yeah. And it's, well, I thought that's sort of, you know, I'm looking for those kind of reasons because why would you do this? What are you trying to do on stage? And, you know, I get uh, at risk of sounding, um, I was going to say immodest, but you know, I've read that I'm, uh, I have goofy stage antics, and it's, that I rant. I have these rants. Dude, when I worked at a rock station in Canada, your Killer Whale Tank version of one song was the most requested song I've ever, like, I've, it's never been anything like. And it was just this moment. Right. Do you know when you're on stage and you're going down that dark alley? <laughs> well, no. And but I do know that I'm planning on you know, having a beginning and a middle and an end and finishing somewhere. I'm trying to be cognizant of composition. So when I'm, you know, up there, it, it, it doesn't, uh, yeah, weird, goofy rants. And that's all that, it just stops there. And I'm like, well, you know, there's, a, there's a, something at work here. Like I'm trying, I'm trying things. And on stage, it all makes sense in, in terms of music and dance. Like I love, I love dance as an expressive form being able to express yourself in that way. You, uh, you know, uh, the last song is called Goodnight Atahuapas Cat on this. It's, why that, first of all? Why that title? Why that song? Well, I think it was inspired, well, it, I don't think, it was inspired by our visit to Fort Albany. I like the image of a band going up there to play. It's a fictional band called the Silver Poets who show up and, hey, we have, we're not here, to, we're just here to get paid. You know, I mean... Are they like the constellations, these other fictional bands you go with? Yeah, I like fictional band names, but... Um, so, yeah, we're just up here, and but we're here, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and we don't think that you're just... that you're not on the way. You know, that you're a fly-in, fly-out community, and, and that you, you know, we're here, you know, we're here to play. Um, Beyond that, I mean, you know, if you read about the communities along James Bay, uh, Western Shore there, you know kind of what they're going through in various forms and ways, you know, and you reconcile that with the people that you meet. And um, 
everyone's like you and me. They're except way funnier, you know, way cooler. Yeah. And, um, and way tougher. Yeah. But, um, and gentler. And uh, anyway, I'm maybe not painting an accurate picture, but at least I'm trying to paint a picture right. that isn't the picture that we all just sort of accept and, and forget about. And this is what I wonder. You have this, I don't know, I don't, the word responsibility, but that's not the word I mean, but it's somewhere in that space. The idea that of the big bands that tour this country, the bands that can fill arenas in this country, there is, you can count them all on one hand, and you're one of them. But you're the only one that on the surface is so overt about things in Canada at this stage. In the way that, you know, you travel the country, people have never been to Bob Cajun, but they know what it is now because of you. A lot of people got to know the Milgard story because of you. Do you, do you recognize that very few in the pop rock space, whatever that is, are doing that, that are naming cities or naming towns and telling Canadian stories, and that's one reason why you do it? Mm. Is sorry. What's the question, George? Well, no. <laughs> no, I mean I'm sorry. But, uh, you um, do it on purpose. The place names and yeah, just the idea of really reflecting. Yeah, but never once to be patriotic or nationalist. Like never once, even when I was younger. Roseanne. Roseanne. That's her name, Roseanne. I'd like to call Roseanne to the stage right now. <laughs> You never throw up your singer, she's gonna help me sing. <laughs> Knocking on heaven's door, put it together for Roseanne. Right. <laughs> before we get to the, uh, You're before, good. What did you? That's good. Before we get to that part, what did you call her? Roseanne's not that hard. I, it was, the music was loud. There was a band playing before and we were side stage and we were really nervous and the music was blaring. Like, You're nervous because it means something. You know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> What's your name? Rosa. And I, I think it, I think I was, oh, I don't know, man. It was like, it wasn't Roseanne. <laughs> Rosette. I was it, calling her Rosette. That's close, man. That's close. <laughs> Rosette. I've never met a Rosette. Oh, why didn't she kick me in the nuts? <laughs> Seven times. <too. laughs> Rosette. Okay, so you, you consciously wrote about these places, but never to be patriotic. Nationalistic, like even when I didn't know any better, I knew enough to think, well, you, 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 it's a beautiful country, it's a big country, and it's a free country, and it's a place where you can decide what you think the country is. And, um, and for that reason, it's, it's full of ideas, full of starting points, full of discourse you know, full of, um, full of shit. <laughs> are, you, uh, are you familiar with the Ken Spencer Science Park? I'm not. Okay, you know who those two are? At the Ken Spencer Science Park at Science World, there are two chickens. One is called Gord, the other is called Downey. <laughs> <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't cry. <laughs> this is really, I don't know what to say. Does it matter which uh, is which? No, no. I don't know. I actually tried to figure out which one was Gord. I, I gotta think Gord is on the right. I gotta think, but I don't know. How do you wow. feel about that? I'm still processing it. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gord and Downey. It's just it's just an odd place that you guys have been because I know like you said challenge is important to you, so you do. I guess try to just to make it feel like a first record. The second record, it, it doesn't feel like a legacy band to you, does it? No. I mean, and practically speaking, this record we recorded like, uh, like we did when we were kids, like, like kids do. You, and primarily, entirely because of, um, because we had to put everything off and put everything on hold. So we knew the songs very well, which is what kids do. Um, and we went in and knocked them out in uh, 10 days, which gave it a, which is what I always prefer to do, because you can become very estranged from your own process, you know, where you actually don't know how to make a record. You're relying on other people. Right. But it I kind of worked entirely, because I went in and was able to, um, 
in the performance, just give it all the emotional oomph, the, you know, the, the rafter scratching uh, emotion that I really needed and wanted for it, for these songs. Is that because like you gave Roseanne the advice? Is it because it meant something? Yeah, yeah. And I just thought, I'm not gonna conserve, I'm not gonna leave anything on the table, I'm just going to use it all up. And, um, and pack it with all those feelings I have of love for my friends and my bandmates and people that supported us, our friends, uh, here and gone. And uh, I just really wanted it to be that, to be ample and grateful in every way, which is two words I'm fond of. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted it to show. So we're pretty fortunate where we don't know from night to night who we're going to be playing to. And it doesn't seem like we're exclusively a college band, which to me is great, you know, because uh, sometimes in, in the college gigs, you know, you're up there and you wonder if you're basically a backdrop for, you know, some big huge beer up or something like that. And that can be more frustrating than playing to no one. Nineteen eighty nine. My concerns are the same. <laughs> they are. Are we just a backdrop for <laughs> some beer up? <laughs> George. Is it always bad though? No. No. No, you take it where you can get it. What's the best city for live music in this country, as has been your experience? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Not saying they're all bad. No, no, they're all good. Um, best city. I'm sorry, it's just, how much time do you people have? Uh, I'm going through province by province. Uh, Hamilton. I don't think he means that. What's your favorite memory from childhood? Oh. What? Favorite memory from childhood? Uh, mm. Well, it's a pretty obvious one. Um, when the Bruins won the Stanley Cup in 1972, really? my brother and I went out onto the... It's too obvious, right? Well, for, as a Habs fan, it brings me pain, but carry they on. They beat the Rangers. <laughs> they beat the Rangers. I was uh, eight, and my older brother and I, he was 12. We went out on our driveway and danced in the rain. And uh, it was a Sunday afternoon, I think, a Saturday afternoon, May 11th. And, uh, and we were just shocked at how eerily quiet it was. There was nobody out. <laughs> it was just us. It was one of those ones where we just sort of stopped dancing and walked back into the house. It's, uh, it's not unlike the Stanley Cup celebration in Carolina or Anaheim. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two guys on the street, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you appear to be a, a pretty balanced guy. What's the one rock star thing you just do where people around you got to remind you, hey, pal? Um, well, I mean, that's the type of thing I'm trying to banish from my... You're talking about this sort of when... What I would call an artist is different than what another, like a person in a record company would call an artist, which would be petulant, whining, demanding, right. a pain in the ass artist. Yes. Um, New Year's Eve on the turning of the millennium, remember the Y2K, uh, we did a big thing and we had this big balloon drop that didn't work. It was supposed to come out of the mouth of this dragon and <laughs> uh, it didn't work. Uh, the stage was littered with balloons. Um, someone had left the back door open to the rink, and it was like this Arctic gale was blowing through the stage. And for me, as a singer, it's like for singers, it's not good. You want it warm, you want it humid, and cold air makes your voice go And so you can't actually trust what you're gonna sing. And I kept asking them in between songs to close this effing door. And, uh, you know, it was beyond everybody. It might not have even been a door. So my reaction to that was to, I fell on a balloon and it went pop. And there, I'm saying there's like 8,000 balloons on the stage. And I decided that I was gonna fall on every balloon. 
with my body <laughs> and kill every, and I didn't stop until they were all broken. And, the and it was a fit of rage. It was nothing artistic about it. It was, I was trying to sort of, <laughs> I'm gonna kill these balloons. And, uh, and I was, you know, the whole Yorick and, and slam on my, and just throwing myself, and it got ridiculous to the point where I think the crew were all in tears. Not from laughing. Not from laughing, like, wow, I'm witnessing just the, the worst blowout I've ever seen. If, uh, if you were to stand... So I don't do that anymore. Yeah, it's done. That's done. If you were to stand near the ferry to Wolf Island, near the K-Rock Center, where would you be standing? Number one, the tragically hip way. The tragically <laughs> hip way. Paul Angwa said that he doesn't drive on that street late at night because he doesn't want someone to accidentally post a picture of Facebook on him on his own street late at night. Do you ever just cruise that street just because? Um, well, we happened to be on it this summer. We were going, I think, to Paul's house, actually, with my kids. And we were at the stop sign I didn't even notice. And my wife said, hey, look. And the kids thought that was actually pretty cool. But I realized I hadn't even mentioned it to them, um, probably because it was such a nail-biting city council vote to decide it. It was that close. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. <clears throat> <laughs> Seven, six. <laughs> you were hoping for more of a slam dunk. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, but it's Kingston, and it's they're very, they consider things carefully and carefully. Right. Well, listen, congratulations. Uh, now for plan A. It's again, it's another great record, man. Well done. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Go down, everybody. Glad to go here. Enjoy that. Amazing.